Hello and welcome to this AIM North America seminar on UDI Beyond the Basics, a masterclass on the evolution of UDI. Brief note on AIM North America, we are an alliance enabling the cooperation, development, standardization of AIDC technologies. From barcodes to RFID to IoT, AIM North America is your advocate. If you would like to learn more about AIM North America and our many initiatives, please reach out to us after the seminar. I would like to thank Innovatum for sponsoring the seminar. Innovatum's Robar delivers many powerful capabilities for the UDI and is delivered with consulting, implementation, and validation assistance. As a true end-to-end -end regulated labeling system provider, Innovatum has been a top innovator in life sciences labeling for over 25 years. Innovatum's fully configurable and easily validatable labeling systems are easily expandable to meet future regulatory needs without involving the IT department. Additional modular capabilities include 100% label inspection and EIFU management with hosting. Learn more by going to Innovatum.com. And once again, thank you so much for sponsoring our event. A few notes before we get started. Uh, first is our antitrust policy. It's the policy of AIM North America to conduct its operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM activity shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. Next, our collaboration and work product policy, AIM North America meetings and seminars like today's are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIM's developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. For our first session, we have Dr. Chang from Duke University Health, who will be discussing how to unleash the potential of medical UDI. Welcome doctor and take it away. Uh, UDI is being adopted by healthcare organizations, but only I would describe it as in fits and starts. And what I would like to do is present to you the, some of the things that we need to stall for within healthcare enterprises and specifically healthcare enterprise operations. I do want to spend a little time talking about the clinically integrated supply chain. Uh, I'm not the first to come up with that term, but I do believe it describes what it is that needs to be accomplished within healthcare enterprises in order to leverage the UDI. Uh, we've fortunately gone live completely in the Duke Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory and the EP Laboratory with UDI-based uh, device tracking and supply tracking. And I'm gonna describe both what it took to get there as well as what the benefits are for accomplishing that. And then use that really as a roadmap, hopefully that other healthcare enterprises uh, can leverage. So, the first question is just a question of time uh, to try to approach the question, are we there yet? Uh, I do want to point out that in 2009, President Obama signed the Americans Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and it's really led to the adoption of electronic health records across um, almost all of healthcare. And uh, over that same course of time, uh, I would also like to point out that the UDI implementation, the final rules were authored by the FDA, the package inserts, uh, excuse me, the package uh, labeling uh, has been brought forward by the manufacturing um, uh, consortiums that uh, now have UDI on package labels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we are far from full UDI implementation uh, in, within healthcare. The contrast to that, by the way, is something that happened over the same course of time, 2009, was when uh, the airline safety revolution really transformed itself from a uh, approach of uh, incidental reporting of issues related to aircraft to something that was a unified data-driven safety agenda. And the reason why I wanna point out this data-driven component is that at its essence, UDI really is about better data better data about and specifically about devices. And the res, uh, reason I think that uh, airlines have now, at least US airlines have uh, not had any pl fatal plane crashes since 2009 is because of the sharing of information. But the rest of the story as described by uh, the Wall Street Journal is that it has proven to be wickedly difficult to implement. And so the parallels here with healthcare, I think uh, you'll see are, are, are quite, uh, uh, are, are quite uh, uh, cogent. All right, so where are we? Well, it is true that it's easier to identify dog food via the UPC than a Becton Dickinson half ml insulin syringe with a 28 gauge needle or really any other device uh, within healthcare. Um, yes, 
there is a UDI on there, but there are also all these other numbers that uh, we have to uh, bring forward. So as Dr. Luxembourg had gone through already, why do we need a UDI? Uh, I think that everybody on this call is cognizant of the potential for opportunities to improve multiple aspects of the delivery of healthcare, uh, reducing medical errors, improving the information integration across health IT systems, identifying devices in adverse event reporting. And again, you can read the rest of this list here. It all kind of makes sense. And in fact, it was brought forward, uh, incorporated into the text of the UDI final rule that's posted in the Federal Register. Where are we, however, within healthcare? Well, there are still lots of issues within healthcare in terms of using the UDI. And I'm gonna break them apart into four separate uh, related issues. Uh, but issue number one, which I list on there as manual processes, probably could be relabeled as inertia. We have been doing things a very specific way as illustrated on this particular slide for as long as I can remember. Uh, yes, we've got some new number, the UDI to chart, but essentially we still write down, we don't write down the UDI, we write down, if you can read the fine print, there's a self-tapping screw there, a, a bolt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We write it down, then somebody has to transcribe it onto another form. It has to be entered manually. And then the physician, lucky if they have actually a report as to what um, uh devices were used because a lot of times we're actually recalling it from memory while we do the medical documentation. So issue number one is there's all these manual processes that are really hard to overcome. Issue number two, and this actually, uh, interestingly enough, there was a question about direct part marking. I would argue that the, the direct part marking works um, when, you can, when you can use a mark for doing the identification of the device, but uh, there are a lot of little devices, like for example, the non-sterils that are supplied in trays that yes, they're sterilized before they're putting into a patient, uh, but uh, direct part marking just, if you will, doesn't work for those. So there's really two classifications of supplies in the operating room, devices that are packaged, where it's easy to find a UDI. And then there's all these little things like bolts, screws, plates, et cetera, that are packaged in non-sterile packaging. Uh, and the question is, well, how do we manage those? Well, if you look at the operating room right now, there are two different ways that these devices are managed. One, uh, if you're lucky enough, you can do UDI-based or barcode-based tracking of the sterile ones that are packaged, but uh, there is no way to do point-of-use scanning inside the sterile field for the non-steriles. So issue number three, then, if we have this problem with the non-sterols, how do we best fix that part of the problem, recognizing that in order to really call it a fix, the ideal state would not just be to be able to identify the devices, but have one single workflow that is marrying workflow with data flow. So an interesting report from the Strategic Marketplace Initiative uh, in terms of ways to do UDI, um, uh, was authored by Jane Pleasance. Uh, you can see kind of my uh, tongue-in-cheek comment about writing things down on inventory sheets. That's really yesterday's technology tomorrow. Uh, direct part marking, not really a viable solution for small parts. Data carrier strips, um, well, once you've taken a few off, yeah, you can identify them, but what do you do about filling up that strip or using it again? Data carrier tags uh, really are cumbersome because they get in the way of the quick, I need four of these screws. So how do you pick those four screws really, really quickly? So I'll get to the end, uh, at the end to propose some alternatives, but suffice it to say, um, issue number three then becomes how to label the non-sterils and build a single workflow around that. And then issue number four in the operating room is that documentation doesn't occur at the point of use. Yeah, for this particular picture, what it's illustrating is that there's a computer in the operating room with somebody, uh, a scrub tech, et cetera, or, or in this particular case, a monitor actually doing some documentation. But I can tell you, this is more the exception than the rule. Most of the time, this computer is down the hall or in somebody's office, and it's done after the fact, not really, again, at the point of use. So this has led to a multitude of issues, both for the clinical care team, as well as health IT systems, from a health IT system, the real problem is a lack of an integrated, what I would call a single source of truth. That's the opportunity for the UDI, 
but we've not been able to implement this single source of, source of truth based on electronically managed data that's acquired at the point of use. So out of this slide, that's really the point that I want you to remember is how do we accomplish what's described as nirvana for health IT systems? There's a nice review in uh, uh, Becker's hospital review about what the clinically integrated supply chain uh, really is. And this, I think, gets us towards that discussion of what are we aiming for? And what we're really aiming for is the collaboration of supply chain professionals, clinicians, and senior leadership so that everybody is working in concert. No, this is not about supply chain and inventory management doing their thing, clinicians doing their thing, nurses doing their thing, uh, et cetera. This is about how do we envision a clinical integration with the supply chain such that everybody is moving forward uh, with, uh, if you will, singing off the same sheet of music. The Health Information Management System Society has created a clinically integrated supply outcomes model, a maturity model that describes the ideal state vis-a-vis -vis this flow of data. Uh, most hospitals, I would argue, are really somewhere around stage two. Yeah, there are inventory management systems, there's tracking, there's automation. Yes, it may be based upon the UDI, uh, but it's really focused on supply chain and supply costs, replenishment, inventory management, et cetera, et cetera, and not the opportunities that a ubiquitous single source of truth would actually accomplish. So uh, to describe our journey at Duke, what we described, what we decided to do was we wanted to get to at least stage six. And that's where the integration of UDI information was clean and tight with care processes, with tracking at the point of care, the enabling of analytics, and the linkage with adverse events and outcomes, anticipating that that would then get us to eventually to stage seven, as you see here. So my next phase of my talk is to talk about what we did at Duke. Uh, so I happen to be positioned to help lead the UDI initiative at Duke, uh, mainly because i had been working with BUILD, working with uh, MD EpiNet, ARM, et cetera, over the years. And uh, my leadership said, okay, now if you're talking about this so much, why don't you see if you can figure out how to make it work? Well, I'm an interventional cardiologist. So I said, yeah, let's take this to the cath lab. Why? Well, it's a domain that I have some influence over. There is a high volume of cases. And fortunately, the supplies and devices that we use in the cath lab are UDI marked. And there's a lot of money that goes through, uh, through the cath lab. So what were our goals? We did want to move towards this single source of truth for all of our disposables, for devices and supplies. Notice it's not just implantables, not just class two, class three devices, et cetera, but really we wanted to bring supply chain management, inventory management in as a holistic whole within our organization so that we have one workflow that managed all this particular, uh, all this data. We wanted to also accomplish point of use scanning of the UDI, including the ability to back off if we scan something and it didn't work or wasn't deployed or was dropped on the floor. We wanted to be able to make sure that we could may, uh, allow the downstream IT systems uh, to be aware of exactly what happened. In order to do this, we recognized there had to be real-time data exchange among the IT systems, and I'll go through what those are in a few moments here. Uh, and the global use of UDI really had to be across, again, not just IT systems, but all of the workflows and the processes that had anything to do with devices, including obviously inventory management supply chain, but also clinical documentation and all the way into billing and charge capture. And I'll show you how we did that uh, in a few moments. We didn't walk into this thinking this was easy. Uh, we actually expected this uh, as we mapped out the plans uh, that it was going to take some time to build it right. There are lots of ways to build things wrong. So the real question is, how do you build things correctly? And so we came together and said, well, this looks like a project. Let's make this a project. And it turned out that we actually had four stages to our project. The first stage was really about strategy setting, if you will, the C-suite side of things. We had to get executives to agree that we wanted to bring forward UDI as a single source of truth that was ubiquitous across all IT systems, as well as all 
information related processes. The second phase was the actual technical specification, not the build, the specification. What did that really mean? Where was data going to flow? What were the IT systems that were going to be used? And what were the resources that we had to bring in play, both money as well as people, to make sure that the systems talked to each other, that we were able to educate our uh, respective workforce that this is a new process that we're going to follow, et cetera, et cetera. There was a technical build component uh, that was really about IT interfaces, but also some modification for the users in terms of user interfaces and lots and lots and lots of testing. And then we went live, if you will, big bang. Uh, we walked in one uh, at the end of, the, uh, uh, of a weekend. Um, uh, we walked into an environment where we were now on live with our UDI uh, uh, barcode scanning system. All right, so what does this really mean? The clinically integrated supply chain from a healthcare enterprise perspective, a perspective really means using the UDI as a single source of truth. You start with the manufacturer, it has to be embedded in supply chain, including a good uh, item master list. It has to be used in terms of inventory management and in terms of stocking the cath lab. There has to be point of use scanning and usage, uh, including wastage and other uh, uses of, uh, of, of equipment and supplies. It has to flow into clinical documentation. I don't want to have to pick up a dictaphone and document from my memory as to what devices I use. No, those same pieces of information need to actually go straight into procedure notes, go straight into the EHR implant log uh, to replace workflows that were manually driven before. It does need to get embedded into charge capture and billing. And just to uh, presage one of the outcomes, we had basically, if you look at this list, it's about three or four manual processes. We converted everything, including charge capture and billing into an electronic process with the result that there was a single so source of truth that was completely consistent across all of the workflows, all of the various forms of documentation. And so that our bills could get dropped as soon as our procedures are done, as opposed to being rejected because of discrepancies uh, with our counts. And then obviously we had to uh, replace our, our, our inventory using a just-in-time um, approach. The data flow looks like this. Obviously the data has to start somewhere. Uh, we barcode, uh, we use the UDR barcode to scan it in. It goes into an inventory management system that data flows, and this is the list of data here, flows into a care coordination interface engine. And then depending upon um, uh, where that data is needed, and for example, it's needed in procedure documentation, it's needed in electronic health record, it's needed in our enterprise data warehouse for research purposes, it's needed for replenishment, all of that data gets formed, filtered, and uh, forwarded in ways that allow for this to accomplish, to be accomplished. So how much time and effort did this take? The technical build, the technical build was north of 300 hours to get all these systems to link to each other and to make sure that everything was done correctly, all right? So just to give you an idea, this is not a small project. This does take lots of time, energy, and focus in order to do this. Now, what did we enable? We enabled standardized device description in our clinical documentation. The physicians have stopped dictating the devices that were used. No more transcription errors in procedure reports. We've accomplished tight inventory management. We've accomplished device use attribution. We've accomplished even management of consigned devices. Uh, so there's a way to manage that. We've put the UDI information for implantable devices into the EHR. We've also used it for device explants, uh, closing that loop. We've used it for administrative reports. We've even used it for recall management of a couple of pacemaker leads. So the single source of truth concept, I think, is a real one. Our results have really been uh, quite positive, quite salutary. There were no glitches with Go Live. Now, remember I said we spent a lot of time building this and educating first. That's a prerequisite for accomplishing this. But to the credit of my team, I would say it was really a non-event. One weekend, uh, after one weekend, we walked in the next morning on my Monday and we were ready to go. We've eliminated multiple different manual processes. We've eliminated clinical documentation errors. We're actually saving time 
And uh, you kind of go back, uh, go down to the bottom list, we're saving money too. Uh, our results are net positive within a year. So my initial ROI calculation was that it would take about three years. My final ROI report back to my leadership was it took three months to recover the amount of time, effort, and money that we uh, uh, had to spend. All right, let me finish up then with uh, just a note about where we need to go next. Uh, the cath lab admittedly is a much more both uh, uh, straightforward environment to work in because it is only semi-sterile and we don't have to deal with uh, direct part marking uh, along the lines of what I mentioned before with the disposable. So there are still four problems that we haven't been able to figure out. We're still working on them, but uh, we haven't been able to completely solve. And um, the first one is back to problem number one. It's the culture. We've been doing things in the OR a certain way for a long time and just changing people's approach is actually quite different. Number two though, is probably the most important one. And that is how do we transform workflows so that instead of two or three or four workflows, they become one unified workflow that is uh, where the workflow is joined tightly with the data flow. Well, in order to accomplish that, we have to associate a UDI with non-sterols uh, and do the same thing in the OR that we did in the cath lab, and that is to drive clinical documentation based upon the UDI. So how are we going to solve that? Uh, one of the approaches that I've been working on is uh, uh, what's called set mapping. Uh, the set mapping approach, if you look at these little dots here, like right there, right there, they're associated with the device. And you can imagine if you had a sterile laser wand, on the field, then as you pulled out this particular plate, you could just tap the laser wand and it would uh, create an environment or create a data flow, I should say, that allows you to bring forward that data associated, the UDI associated with that particular device and bring it into IT systems. So how would you do this? You would need something so that you could scan on the point or at the point of use on the field, but you also need to be able to scan devices on the, um, uh, uh, or as they're being brought to the table, uh, if they're packaged. So uh, this kind of one-stop solution here, this magic thing in the middle here is really the systems integrator so that you then end up with one process. So that's where we're going. That's one of the huge challenges that uh, we still have yet to solve. Uh, suffice it to say, nobody solved this yet. And so the answer to the very first question is, are we there yet? Well, the answer is no, we still have way, a ways to go. But uh, I think we're in the process of trying to really figure out how to accomplish this, uh, because uh, as Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, chances are you will end up somewhere else. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Doctor. Really appreciate your insights as well here today. We do have a little bit of time for some questions, so let's get into it. Um, first, uh, was a little comment, amazing system, and so good to see the concept in practice. Uh, so for cybersecurity requirements, uh, are they included into the technical build? And if there are plans to pilot this build in other areas of the hospital or other hospitals? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we have no desire to require, uh, to force every healthcare enterprise to spend 300 to 500 person hours of work uh, time to do this. So one of the things, one of the main objectives of doing it uh, uh, here at Duke was to also author the playbook so that we could just hand across a playbook and said, this is what you need to do. Uh, you don't really need to be that original in terms of your thinking, just follow the playbook and you can accomplish this. We're convinced that anybody can do this. It does take some effort, but what we're aiming for is uh, an amount of effort that's say 25% of what it took us to do it because we had to figure it out. Uh, if we can uh, then help uh, others do this, uh, the uh, the um, uh, scale then gets accomplished. So um, the rest of the story, yeah, we are, again, trying to figure out how to do this in the operating room. It is a collaboration, as you can imagine, among multiple groups, uh, supply chain, inventory management. Uh, there's multiple different companies. We're trying to come up with some, uh, if you will, data standards for the handling information. And then workflow modeling, uh, business process modeling to uh, make sure that people understand what their roles are in the new world order, et cetera. So uh, please stay tuned. Um, I'm very interested. And if anybody out there is interested in helping to try to author the author the playbook and get this done, 
uh, please uh, contact me and um, uh, we can uh, collaborate on this together. Great. Another question we have is, did you experience barcodes that you had difficulty scanning? So Dr. Luxembourg actually introduced that concept. Uh, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. Uh, the problem with current packaging is there's nothing on the package that says it's the UDI. Uh, there is that ISO standard that has been brought forward. It is voluntary right now, uh, you know, with the letters UDI. I think that's going to make a huge difference, but uh, we have had to train our staff over and over and over again. This is the UDI. This is not the UDI. A typical uh, package in the cath lab and the EP lab has at least four sets of barcodes on them. And uh, the, the good news is once you've done it a few times, uh, you kind of get used to what it looks like and where it's located. And then it uh, becomes less prone to uh, error. But uh, the, it is a problem. Now, the rest of the story, at least our inventory management system, if you scan a barcode and it's not the UDI, uh, and this has to do with, inter, uh, with programming the interface, the computer actually tells you, you did not scan the UDI barcode. You, it'll, it'll tell you what barcode that is. And so uh, that's how we also have done some, if you will, self-correcting uh, with that. But I think that's part of the user interface work that has to be done to be successful with UDI. You actually have to return information to the user to confirm that they've either scanned the UDI and that's what you're, uh, that's what's being asked for, or that you are scanning a different barcode. Great, and one last question, and once again, we'll have more time later uh, for more questions. Um, on the unsterilized tray parts, would you consider novel serialization technologies or is barcode mandatory? Yeah, so um, I, I don't think that quote unquote barcode is what is necessary. So if you looked at the, in detail on that slide that I just showed, uh, what is output by the system is a barcode, so a barcode system can read it. Uh, that, if you will, is compliant with the regulation. The real issue is how do you identify devices, especially if you can't direct mark them, especially if they are, uh, again, these non-sterols. And so uh, I, I'll admit we've kind of gone around the, the issue as to um, you know, how best to uh, implement a barcode because it really isn't the barcode. It's the piece of information that comes out of that that's really relevant. So uh, I think the direct answer to your question is that, uh, no, we've not barcoded uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the non-sterile trays. Uh, what we're doing is figuring out a way to get the equivalent of the UDI out of that information uh, using, the, using a different approach as opposed to trying to barcode everything. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Chang, uh, for your time and insights today. Thank you. Uh, please check out Innovatum.com to learn more about their solutions in the UDI space. Uh, and our next speakers will be discussing the challenges with UDI implementation. So uh, welcome Jay Crowley from USDM and Dennis Black from BD. Uh, Jay, you can kick things off now. Great. Thanks. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Steve and, and Jimmy, for your presentations. Uh, some housekeeping notes there. So um, I will go first uh, for the next uh, uh, 12, 13 minutes or so, and then turn it over to Dennis to finish up. Um, uh, Jimmy uh, answered the question or tried to answer the question, are we there yet from a clinical perspective or a clinical implementation perspective with respect to UDI? I'd like to pivot a bit and ask the question, are we there yet from a regulatory perspective uh, or from a, a, a device specific implementation perspective? And I don't think we are. I think we, we still have some ways to go, some issues to deal with. Um, and that's what I'd like to, to, to briefly discuss today. Um, a little background, prior to joining USDM eight years ago, um, I was at FDA and uh, led the development of what is now um, the FDA's UDI regulation and good ID. Um, left, as I mentioned, uh, right after its publication, shortly after its publication at the end of 2013, to help manufacturers implement UDI. And so that I've been working on implementation from a, from a device perspective now for eight years, it's been very interesting, um, very challenging. And as I mentioned, I think we still have a ways to go. Um, so we're talking obviously primarily about the US. We've touched on some various global harmonization issues. 
Uh, Steve mentioned some of the activities going on from, from FDA's perspective, um, but know that there is a lot going on. So if, if you are a manufacturer of a medical product and you distribute globally, there is a lot happening. It's a very dynamic, um, act, very dynamic scene right now. Lots of, lots of countries very interested in, in UDI and the value that it, it can bring. Um, what's interesting, I would say, when we look globally, however, is that though fundamentally um, UDI is, is, is understood, uh, Steve gave some, some good sort of basic infrastructure ideas about what UDI is. Uh, what we see, interestingly, is that the use cases that various players bring are different. So different countries, different regulators different commercial or country specific requirements bring different use cases. And so though ideally from a label package perspective, we understand what UDI is and how it should be applied in, in many situations, what is necessarily different and where the challenge really starts to now reside is in the data about that product and how we think about information that we're distributing, if you will, for the same product in, in various, many different various locations. So this has become the challenge. I'm sure Dennis will touch on this a little bit more during his presentation as well, uh, as manufacturers look to, to fulfill global regulatory databases with UDI data. I would say that the other interesting issue that, that we see is what I call uh, the evolving device data model. Right. The, in, in when we started at, at FDA in, in developing what is now UDI and Good ID, uh, we had a fairly, what I would say, core set of data, um, fairly straightforward set of data that we thought uh, most manufacturers could answer uh, for their products. That turned out not to be particularly true. Uh, we've seen a lot of data quality issues, a lot of confusion about what these attributes mean and how they should be answered for different products. Um, so as we, as we continue to, to understand that and improve on that, at the same time, we see growing back to the use case, um, use cases that I mentioned previously, we see a growing set of data that we need to be able to associate to a device and to maintain that over time. That, that sort of maintenance over time issues gets lost. Often in the conversation, we think about an initial development and, and submission of data without really thinking about how we're going to manage that, having the tools, systems, processes in place to do that. And so we see that the data often becomes stale or incorrect as we're unable to keep up with, with the changes to the product. And I think as we continue to move out into the, to these outer circles, particularly out into the gray outer circle, um, we start to develop some very interesting pieces of information that are going to be challenging to uh, create and maintain parent-child relationships, for example, in kits. Uh, country of origin has, has again become an issue uh, during the pandemic. Where, where did this device actually come from? Uh, we're seeing some changes to the way that private labeling is managed globally. Um, we've heard uh, previous, uh, both uh, Steve and Jimmy talk about the adverse event reporting and recalls. So really our ability to manage products at this level, not just have UDIs on them and, and uh, on devices and, and be able to, to scan those, but actually to manage information so that we can identify those products downstream. So lots of very interesting data issues that, that are going to continue to evolve. And, and, and it brings me to this, this whole notion of, of really why did we start down the UDI path in the first place? So if I go back to 2002, 2003, when, when we started on this journey, it was really about understanding where devices are, how did they get on the market, who have they been used on, right? This whole, this whole visibility and control issue, which was really underlying um, at the time, US FDA's now other regulators need to have granular, ubiquitous, as Jimmy said, identification of devices and be able to manage that throughout the device's life cycle. So we, we've heard these terms used. 
um, I think it's important to understand what is driving all of the various stakeholders. And I would, I would argue that it really is about understanding what device is being used, visibility, and having control over that, that the different stakeholders who are involved with their particular use cases have the control over the devices and the information associated with them so that they, they, can, they can fulfill whatever their particular use case is. And again, this is going to continue to grow and evolve. UDI, uh, from at least from my perspective, my days at FDA was never intended to be static. This was this was a foundational construct, and we were intended to build upon it over time. I think we're still in the foundation building stages, um, but soon we will continue to see that that uh, those additional use cases build upon it and additional opportunities for us to leverage UDI moving forward. Um, I don't, I don't wanna go through this in, in gory detail, um, but I will tell you that there are a lot of issues um, left for us to figure out. Um, I know we're, we're talking about this and, and, and obviously uh, Jimmy and his colleagues and Duke have come a long way and, and uh, Terry, and others will talk more about um, uh, various other implementation activities. But I can tell you that every day I have these conversations with device manufacturers struggling to understand how best to, to meet the UDI requirements, not just from a regulatory perspective, but, but from a larger healthcare ecosystem perspective, how can I do this where it's going to make the most sense? And we struggle, I would argue, with a lot of very basic concepts. Um, the UDI rule, IMDRF guidance, European regulations, other regulators, uh, regulations talk about the label of the device as a default location for UDI, and yet we struggle to understand really in many cases where that is, what that is. Um, and if we don't know where we're going to put the UDI, um, we don't have a consistent understanding of where we're going to put the UDI, we, we necessarily end up with divergence. As, as we look uh, across the across the whole spectrum of devices, we oddly um, struggle with what even is a medical device or an accessory to a medical device. Um, we have very broad definitions in, in in every regulatory domain, but we really struggle to understand clearly what other parts um, associated with the device are, are subject to UDI. Um, we really lack definitions and concepts. We use the, the device industry in general uses a lot of terms very loosely, uh, components, spare parts, service parts, replacement parts, a lot of terms that actually have no regulatory definition um, and therefore are, are, are interpreted differently by, by different uh, companies on different devices. We've heard some <laughs> questions about direct mark. Um, uh, surprising to me, it, it remains a, a very difficult concept um, for manufacturers to understand and implement, um, particularly as it relates to uh, the label requirements, right? So there is this additional direct mark requirement. Um, what does that mean? When does it apply? Uh, to which devices does it apply? Um, I think FDA's guidance is, is very good, um, but it does leave a few holes, obviously, since it keeps coming up that we're left to, to to, to really understand. Um, there was a question to Jimmy about barcodes, um, the whole notion of, of multiple barcodes, single barcodes, data matrix, which barcodes, barcode verification, a lot of issues. Uh, so another question about RFID, a lot of questions in general about AIDC um, and, and which, which one or one should be used. Um, I think that was, it's the, it's the downside, if you will, to this technology neutral approach that, that has generally been taken for UDI. We look, for example, in contrast to what happens in the pharma space, uh, where we say very specifically, use a linear barcode, use a data matrix. Here, that's not what happened. Uh, so it allowed for technological advancement but at the same time, it leaves quite a bit of ambiguity when it comes time for different stakeholders to understand what should be used. Um, we struggle too with HRI and what it means, even with FDA's very good additional guidance and a number of other issues that you can see here. Uh, I would say probably the other biggest issue that we see is around this notion of kits, convenience kits. 
um, uh, means many different things to many different players. Um, the, the challenge, again, going back to my original statement is that we don't really have very good definitions or really any definitions, I would say, for groups of devices that are not kits. Um, so we know when we can read essentially what a convenience kit is or should be, uh, particularly from a UDI perspective. Uh, but what we don't know how to do is to manage things that are not convenience kits from a UDI perspective. So again, a lot of, lot of definitions that are missing, a lot of guidance that is missing that we really need globally in order for us to continue to, to move forward and to really converge um, on, on these UDI requirements. I want to spend the last minute here really talking about the upcoming implementation in the U.S. of, of UDI for Class 1 products. Very important time. Um, you know, this is what really brings value to the entire UDI uh, conversation is when we have UDI applied to all products, uh, Class 1 being by far the largest group of devices that we're going to see. But there are a lot of unique challenges uh, really for all stakeholders um, when it comes time for class one implementation, uh, primarily because the vast, vast majority of class one devices are actually exempt um, from any sort of pre-market submission. And so we, the, the, the regulatory landscape hasn't necessarily kept up uh, with the changes that have occurred you know, since 1976. Uh, with the vast majority of class one devices. So there, as we move towards that September 2022 deadline for class one products, um, I do expect a lot, of, a lot of conversations will need to take place so that we can do that um, as, as best we can and really bring value to the, the total UDI conversation. And with that, Dennis, I will turn it over to you. Hi, this is Dennis Black. I currently work as UDI Program Director for BD out of Franklin Lakes, New Jersey. I work within our uh, regulatory affairs team, and my goal is to get UDI implemented, not just in the U.S., but globally. I think Jay brought up some interesting points and like to further expand on some of the ideas that he raised. Um, first off, with our product line, we have an incredibly diverse product line, and I think that uh, brings some additional complexities when we think of UDI. When we think of marking instruments, it's very different than single use device devices. It's different than software. It's different than configurable devices. And it's something that we need to account for. I think we've done pretty well with the US implementation. And as we've looked at this above all, yes, we need to meet the regulators requirements, but we're also implementing UDI in such a way that this is going to work for the healthcare provider. I think Dr. Chang raised some interesting points with um, what the healthcare provider has to go through. And we try to think this through in everything that we're doing. In addition to meeting the um, FDA's requirements, where you're thinking of the end user and want to make sure that as they're trying to scan that product at the point of care, that our labeling practices will be predictable and that UDI is going to be clear and apparent to the end user. From a high level perspective, we can look at UDI and it's easy to think about device identifiers. And yes, we need to put that on a label, maybe mark, it, mark the product directly also. And then we need to gather a lot of UDI data. At a high level, those are the key points that we need to think about. But uh, I believe that there is more to this than those three components. And we have to be thinking of UDI not just for the basics and how to assign the numbers, but we have to look at some of the underlying processes. Uh, the data creation is proving to be, I think, particularly complicated. We had a clear set of requirements from US FDA as we look at what we need to do in Europe and some other jurisdictions. I think UDI data has become a lot more complicated. And I'll show you some examples in a few minutes. We also need to add UDI to applicable processes. In the US, we need to think about how we're going to use UDI in the, in the entire complaint process and make sure that we have the device identifiers and production identifiers associated with our products. 
But if we look at some of the things that we need to do in, let's say, South Korea, where we have the beginning of track and trace through UDI, or some of the expectations in Europe, where it really requires that class three products are tracked by the distributor and by the healthcare provider, I think a lot more work needs to be done to make sure that UDI is embedded into various processes. And then we think about maintaining the system. Yes, we need the policies and procedures and work instructions, but the change control aspect of UDI, DI triggers and maintaining some of our data going forward is proving to be incredibly complex. The UDI requirements around the world are generally harmonized. I know that each and every regulator has considered the IMDRF requirements as they've come up with their regulations and they're all sort of on the same path, but as depicted here, we do see some instances where some of the requirements veer off a little bit and we end up with some other requirements that are a little bit different than the rest of the world. For BD, we're currently implementing UDI for the countries listed here, for the US, for the EU, China, South Korea, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and also in Taiwan. And if you look at what's under development, we have a long list of countries that are either finalizing their regulations right now or will in the next year or so. And we expect it's gonna become incredibly complicated as each and every one of these requirements will likely have some differences compared to what we've seen before that. What we wish we had is we wish we had one set of requirements for labeling and one set of UDI data. This is what we would view as being perfect. If we could have a harmonized requirement that allowed us to mark something once and gather one set of data, that would be perfect. But I think reality is we're seeing differences in each country. We're seeing slight differences that will force us to do things a bit differently around the world. Part of this has to do with just differences in what's being asked for. And then I think in other instances, and I think Jay alluded to it earlier, where we have some terms and we think of what a kit is or a procedure pack, or maybe even what's considered to be a single use device. Some of those things surprisingly do vary by jurisdiction. And I think it makes, makes it that much more complicated for us to implement UDI. I have eight items listed here that we're finding need to be observed and need to be factored in for UDI. We don't have time to get into great detail, but I'd like to just show you some examples. And I'm, I suppose for other device manufacturers, if you're implementing in all these same markets, you're probably running across most of, or perhaps even all of the same things that we're describing here. Um, one is contrasting marking requirements. Much of the EU requirement for UDI labeling is the same as FDA, but there are some differences. We don't have time to go through all of these today, but um, Certainly there are some. We think of software where the US regulation, when it came out, it didn't really, didn't really have software version where that's plainly spelled out in the EU. If you look at some of the exceptions, there is an exception process in the US, but there's really no process offered up in Europe. We sometimes find we have confusing labels or confusing I say labels, labels for the attribute or definitions. Primary DI means something different for the US than it means in South Korea or China. In those two countries, it means the UDI DI is the lowest saleable unit, whereas US FDA has a different description. This is fine and it can work, but I think it's important for device manufacturers to make sure they have clarity with their descriptions and they have this well thought out and clearly communicated or there will be data errors. With different list values, it would seem as though we would have the exact same way of describing a product in each country. Here's one example where we don't. We have a different choice of clinically relevant sizes in the US than what we have in Europe. And what I believe we're gonna end up with before it's all over with, I think we're gonna have instances where we have the same device and we'll need to use one set of clinically relevant sizes in the US, and then we will be describing that device using a different set of clinically relevant size values for Europe. This also holds true with sterilization methods. We have different drop-down choices. 
And this is something that we're building into our PIM system as we think in terms of implementation. But you can see how confusing this gets. We can't assume that just because we've described a product one way in the US, that we can use the same choices to describe the product in China or South Korea. UDI DI triggers is another area that is going to become incredibly complicated. This is the IMDRF description of what a UDI DI trigger is. Very modest list of requirements. I think the US FDA also has a modest list of requirements for UDI DI triggers. But as we look at this around the world, it's different in different jurisdictions. For the EU, we count up 87 different reasons if we include the um, buddy requirements and some of the non-changeable fields. Your company might end up with a different quantity depending on which devices you actually sell in that market. But you can see what a challenge this is when we think of change control and making sure that we've accounted for this and that we're communicating the same information in each market. I suppose it's easy if you're selling different products in each market, but what we do for many instances, we have the same device that's sold in all markets or maybe the same device is sold in multiple markets. But this is something that we have to continue to watch and we have to make sure that we've got this set properly and aligned so that we can keep up with it. So we're doing more work and as far as getting this set as change control, I suspect this is a challenge for others on this call also. For implementation, we're not done just because we've hit the specific milestones each regulator has. We're finding that we need to continue to invest in people, process, and technology for people. In addition to having our central teams, we have teams within each country where we're implementing, and we also need the help and support of various functions within our organization. For processes, we continue to invest in policies, procedures, and work instruction and in making sure that we have clarity and written documentation that um, supports what we're doing. Embedding UDI in our QMS is essential and making sure that we have clear requirements as far as what's done for complaint handling, et cetera. And then the commercial aspect. We don't have time to go through all of this in great detail, but for anyone implementing UDI, I suspect that you probably are covering all three areas with your plans also. I think more work needs to be done for harmonization. And Jay touched on some important points earlier, and I wanna stress some of those same items. What we'd like to see are more harmonized regulations. I think it becomes difficult as we get these existing, or we get regulations out, and it's harder to change an existing regulation than when it's being created but it seems as though more work needs to be done through IMDRF or other forums to make sure that the regulations don't drift apart and continue to become different around the world. I think there needs to be continued efforts on the part of device manufacturers to where we can converge and come up with similar practices. I know how confusing this can be for a healthcare provider as they look at it and they don't understand what we're doing or if which one is UDI compliant, which one is not, or to understand some of the barcodes they see on products. But I think this is an area that the industry needs to continue to work on. I believe we've made very good progress over the last six or seven years as an industry. And it's encouraging to hear uh, the examples like Duke where they're using UDI effectively. I, and I know other hospitals out there are doing similar work or trying to work towards harnessing this for clinical purposes. But I think we still have a long way to go as an industry. I think we have to work together and think through how we can have convergence of practices and also think through how we can come up with regulations that are gonna be more similar than dissimilar as we continue on with implementation. So Mike, I'll turn it over to you. I don't know if we have time for questions now, but, uh, or if you're gonna move into panel discussion, but I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, we can take a few questions. Uh... Dennis, thank you. Uh, and, th and this question is actually for you. Uh, how does master UDI DI affect UDI implementation? Well, um, fortunately, we aren't one of the companies making contact lenses at this point in time, but I think I've been, been involved with those discussions. I think it's incredibly complicated. I know that the EU would like to see this master UDI as an overarching standard that's going to help with products that have tremendous number of SKUs. 
I'm following some of the discussions and participating in the work group, but I think that more work needs to be done. I think it's going to be confusing to think through which is the UDI DI and has the you know labeling that we're expecting and the master UDI um, that is that's also coming at us. I would encourage those of you who haven't been involved to get involved with the GS1 work group that's sorting through this right now, if you're a GS1 labeler, but I think that more work needs to be done on this. And I think it's, if I can add to that, Dennis, I, I think it's probably a good time to um, reassess <clears throat> some of the foundational concepts that led to this conversation. Um, I'm not sure that there is really a valid reason to create yet another identifier, um, but we seem to have jumped over that conversation and just jumping into solving a problem that maybe doesn't actually need to be solved. Thank you again uh, for your time and insights uh, to our uh, previous speakers. And I, I wanna once again uh, thank Innovatum uh, for uh, being the sponsor for today's seminar. And please check out their website, innovatum.com to learn more about their solutions in the UDI space. Our last speakers are gonna be part of an exciting panel discussion. Patty, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Michael said, my name is Patty Blessing and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. I'm the Vice President of Kavu Group and I sit on the Board of AIM. In addition, I chair the UDI work group where we advocate for global standards for medical devices. So my name is Olga van Groh Lawler. I'm a Principal Regulatory Affairs Specialist at Boston Scientific with extensive experience in EMEA Regulatory Affairs. I've been active in Boston's Medical Device Regulation Project for the last number of years, offering inputs to various topics, including UDI and UDIMED. Having been involved in MedTech Europe's uh, UDMED and UDI working groups since 2016, I'm on the UDI core team and one of the members selected to represent industry at the UDMED Actor Registration Working Group with the European Commission. And I also participate in national trade association efforts and the GS1 Healthcare Public Policy Group. Thanks. I'm Terry Reed. I'm Director of Partner Relationships at Symmetric Health Solutions. Uh, prior to that, I worked with Jay um, at FDA, and uh, I was the Associate Director of Informatics at the time and in charge of the team that developed a good ID and rolled out the regulation. I then became the Senior Advisor for UDI Adoption uh, in Electronic Health Information, a very long title, uh, which was focused on UDI adoption activities. Um, worked a little while at Duke Clinical Research Institute, looking at how device identification impacts research. And then, uh, as I said before, I now work um, at Symmetric. Uh, I've provided feedback and participated in IMDRF discussions, ARM Learning EDI community discussions that was started under my watch at FDA. Um, so I've been involved with a lot of uh, adoption activities and data-driven activities. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, I, I've been a long-term faculty member at Arizona State University, um, where I spent my first years working in the healthcare supply chain, um, and more recently uh, focused on healthcare delivery and population health. Um, so I've been very involved with teaching, research, curriculum development at both ASU and Mayo. Um, I'm also a physician trained in internal medicine, um, and I've been involved in UDI work for um, over 10 years now and know most of, or almost all of the folks talking today. Um, my main focus has been UDI implementation in health systems and UDI uses. Um, and I've been involved with some large research projects such as BUILD, UDI to Claims, um, and currently um, an SEC funded UDI adoption and application. Um, so I'm very invested in building the evidence, building on prior work, and, and overall advancing the field of UBI adoption. So glad to be here today. Thanks so much. You know, from the manufacturer to the patient, each state stakeholder stands to gain from the visibility of the unique device throughout the ecosystem. Areas of focus throughout the implementation of these standards have always included research, uh, device approval, supply chain operations, post-market surveillance, and patient care. This morning, we've heard from the FDA and from other thought leaders that are contributing to these advancements in UDI. 
I'd like to start by asking our panel of experts representing stakeholders from the manufacturing, research, and system sectors, as well as representation from both the EU and the US, to give us their thoughts on successes we have seen in the implementation of UDI over the past 18 months. Olga, as a manufacturer and a representative of users in the EU, where have you seen some successes? Thanks, Patty. Yeah, so being based in the EU, for me, the single biggest success or achievement I've seen in the last 18 months is, of course, reaching the date of application of the new EU medical device regulation, or the MDR, in May of this year, which incorporates as an integral part, of course, the legislation of the legislation, the UDI system. Due to time constraints, um, I'll pull out what I believe at this stage are the theoretical major successes of the new legislation in relation to UDI, with a caveat that I, I don't have time, of course, to discuss implementation timelines, etc. But one of the key aspects is the creation of the European Database on Medical Devices, UDIMED, which is the beating heart or the engine of the MDR. UDIMED comprises six separate and distinct modules with access restricted to various actors and housing different data sets. There's an actor registration module, a UDI and device registration module, a notified body and certificates module, a vigilance module, a clinical investigation and performance study module, and a market surveillance module. And one of the keys or threads tying all of these modules and data sets together is the UDIDI and the EU concept of the basic UDIDI. So essentially, UDIMED will contain a living picture of the complete life cycle of devices available on the EU market. And a large part of that information will be publicly available. Further to that, the MDR requires implant cards to be provided for all implantable devices unless they're specifically exempted. The implant card information will include, among other things, the UDI of the device. Having the UDI device, uh, having the UDI on the implant card will enable patients to access information regarding their implant via UDIMED. This includes all of the device data attributes critical warnings and precautions, a summary of safety and clinical per performance, which includes a patient section written in language that's understandable to the layperson, and so on. The MDR also defines distinct economic operators in the supply chain. So you have the manufacturer, the importer, the distributor, who all play an integral role in compliance and the traceability of medical devices. The MDR includes trickle-down responsibilities in that each economic operator is checking that the upstream economic operator in the supply chain has met certain obligations and that the manufacturer has assigned UDI to devices. Economic operators also have a responsibility to store and keep, preferably by electronic means, the UDI of class three implantable devices. And healthcare institutions also have the same requirements to store and keep UDI for class three implantable devices. So <clears throat> all of these requirements should in time lead to a more robust and highly regulated supply chain. The MDR paves the way for a more patient-friendly environment where transparency, traceability, and patient access to information are paramount. The traceability of devices by means of the UDI system should also significantly enhance the effectiveness of the post-market safety related activities. So while a lot of positive steps have already been taken in the EU regarding the legislation and a huge amount of work has been done in the last 18 months, a lot more work is still required to ensure the success of the UDI system. And of course, the build of UDIMED itself is still ongoing uh, and full functionality is not expected for a couple of years. Thanks, Olga. That was great. And I, I think that, um, that Terry has some things that she can offer uh, based on her experience. I think there are things that, that we see happening across the pond, if you will, <laughs> that uh, very much matches what you're talking about. Uh, so thank you, Patty. And I was looking at the time frame that uh, was mentioned, the 18 months. And as it turns out, uh, that was exactly June of 2020 when I started at Symmetric. So I did an exercise and looked at my calendar, uh, which was accessible to me. Um, and I, I thought about well, what, what am I considering success? So my definition of success when it comes to UDI um, is uh, that people continue to talk about it, that there's a demand for it, that people are trying to understand it. Um, so I just made a list and I, I know we don't have 
time, I have, I stopped at 10 uh, activity successes. And here they are. So the top 10, let's put it that way. Uh, I see the demand for integrating UDI and data from authoritative sources like Good ID is increasing. You can see that with Jimmy's uh, presentation. It's also being evidenced in my own world at Symmetric where we have gone from 167 hospitals uh, that were signing contracts with us about UDI integration to over 400 today. So that's 18 months. Um, another aspect in registries, in June of 2020, uh, there was a public announcement by a very prominent registry that they had tried to integrate Good ID data and that they were no longer going to have any plans to expand beyond one device type. And they have subsequently reconsidered that decision um, because they are starting to see possibilities when you actually improve the quality of the data in Good ID. UDI is also being used as master data, and there's a lot of more documented savings in the past 18 months than I've seen previously. Manufacturers, uh, Olga talking about Unimed, I've seen that manufacturers who initially submitted their data in Good ID are looking at improving the quality, as Dennis mentioned, um, for both Unimed and Good ID, which I think is a positive step for their own internal consistency. Um, I, we personally participate in a MedTech Europe pilot looking at GMDN assignments to UDI DI. So there's a lot of interest now also in uh, how nomenclature, which identifies at the group level and how um, UDI DI at the item level works together. The, there are public private efforts and I know I'm gonna run out of time. So I'm just gonna list them and maybe come back to them later. Currently there is a World Health Organization feasibility study that uses the availability of access good ID in UDIMED um, to improve uh, the mapping between nomenclatures. There's interest by regulators in how UDI and data and access good ID can assist with supply chain resiliency. There is an arm learning UDI community. Australia under Dennis's leadership had a UDI DI work group. Um, and as Steve mentioned, there was an MDIC and SCC. So lots of activity, interest, and ongoing learning. Those were, I count as successes. Thank you. <laughs> Terry, thanks. Those are, those are some great successes and certainly worth, uh, we're celebrating. You mentioned the growth in the number of hospitals that you have uh, registered or are working with now. And I think that's probably something close to Natalia's heart. So Natalia, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on success? Yeah, absolutely. And I liked uh, Terry's, Terry's list. I have a couple crossover. I, I'm, I could talk about a lot of successes and I like to think of them as progressive successes because truly in the last 18 months, you know, my focus is health systems. Um, because of the pandemic, things have been really challenging. But so I like to think of progressive successes in UDI implementation. But number one, definitely more U.S. health systems have implemented or are planning to implement UDIs in clinical workflows. <clears throat> we heard from Dr. Chang earlier about the Duke journey. So some um, in the U.S. are quite mature like Duke and leading the way, um, which is absolutely critical to provide those, uh, you know, playbook for others. Um, I do have to say, though, there are many that are not as advanced or not there at all. Um, it is still somewhat slow and, and being done by those with, without a requirement. Um, but number two or second, the evidence base for UDI implementation is growing. And as a clinical researcher, this is really exciting to me um, because research informs policy and practice. So just as a few examples, um, stemming out of the, the BUILD initiative where I worked with um, Dr. Chang as a co-investigator, um, we developed a UDI implementation roadmap um, based on the experiences of 10 diverse health systems. Um, and this roadmap has detailed recommendations and stops for hospitals to follow. And this has actually just been published and is available as an open access article. And I'll direct um, attendees to that at the end of the panel. Um, we also have an ongoing project funded by NestCC where we're looking at their research health system partners and looking at UDI implementation. So these are health systems that do significant medical device evaluation and research. 
Um, and we're finding there's a continuum of implementation in these health systems. And so we're trying to figure out what are facilitators and what are barriers for some not to implement and, and also build on the, the build roadmap. Um, and a last example, a UDI resource center just went live last week on the NESCC website that includes publications that are relevant to UDI uh, implementation, plus a lot of other information. Number three, from a policy perspective, um, and we heard about this earlier in Dr. Luxembourg's um, presentation, but the requirement for UDI, DI for implantable devices to be included on the insurance claims form is a really important effort. Although it's very slow, it is continuing to make its way through the bureaucratic process for the claim form change expected in 2024. And more recently, Senators Warren and Grassley sent a letter to X-12 requesting an update on this and requested that this change be expedited, um, which is good to have interest from Capitol Hill. And we actually published earlier this year a health affairs blog piece, a, a call to action of sorts on this issue and the leadership that CMS should take to require uh, this of hospital systems. Um, and lastly, or fourth, there has really been tremendous multi-stakeholder work to address challenges and, and help solidify the foundation, as Jay called it earlier, for a broad UDI system. And so different competencies and strengths have been bought to, brought together um, in this very committed community. Um, and one example is ARMS learning, uh, learning UDI community. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. You know, adoption of anything comes with challenges. Um, again, leveraging your own perspectives, what are the barriers that are preventing UDI from being called a total success? Um, and as a second part of that question, I'd ask you to also maybe think about providing some real life examples that you can share with us where you've seen some of those barriers. Natalia, I know you just gave us a great uh, you know, response, but you were working with some of those that should benefit the most from UDI. Where do you see the challenges that need to be addressed? Um, absolutely, and I really have seen this in um, my research projects, I'll be honest with you. Um, first, to realize the UDI rule objectives that were very nicely laid out by Dr. Luxemburg um, and next steps for UDI use, which has really been laid out by uh, prior speakers, UDIs have to be captured during clinical care. So. The problem is there is not a requirement, a mandate for health systems to adopt UDI. So this is a significant barrier. And so this really needs to move from discretionary that hospitals are choosing that they wanna do it. They see the ROI for their system to being required. Um, and as mentioned in research, we are really hearing about the lack of, this lack of mandate as a barrier um, in my on ongoing project for health systems to implement UDI. Um, and, and I actually also saw an earlier question posted um, as to whether FDA is working with CMS to require health system adoption of UDI. And this is really an important area that's on the minds of many people who are involved in advancement of UDI adoption. Um, secondly, and, and Dr. Chang um, kind of touched on this certainly, building the IT infrastructure necessary for health system UDI implementation is a big job. Um, it's doable, but it is a heavy lift. And there are a lot of steps that need to be accomplished. And we really heard about this when we were um, involved in the BUILD initiative. And it is touched on in the roadmap that, that I previously um, referred to. Number three, lack of UDI, this awareness is really significant. Um, you know, sometimes people have limited understanding, sometimes they have no knowledge of UDI, and sometimes the information they know isn't even accurate. Um, and again, we're seeing this as a barrier in my ongoing research project, um, where actually pockets of people in the health system may know about UDI and its value, and others don't at all. Um, and I've been involved in a number of research studies where we've done surveys, interviews, focus groups, a myriad of, of methods, uh, looking, talking to physicians, nurses, patients. And we just found great variability in that awareness and depth of knowledge. Um, and then 
last but not least, we've had excellent people who've been working on UDI and health systems, industry, research groups, um, government agencies, advocacy, advocacy groups, et cetera. Um, but high level leadership at this time to consistently drive UDI adoption in the US is lacking. I mean, policy and collaboration are significant needs and attention and interest in this has waxed and waned over time. So I'll pass it back to you, Patty. Thanks so much. Uh, Terry, I know that you, um, your, your uh, company tries to streamline things, but I know you've seen some barriers as well. What can you comment on? Um, so the, actually there's a lot of overlap, so I will try and uh, keep my comments brief, but uh, my number one uh, actually comes from my experience uh, in policy development. And um, I heard a really great quote in, the, in an Obama book, The Promised Land, where he said, uh, the federal government is an ocean liner, not a speedboat in how it operates. And it takes years of building strategies, implementing, adapting, and creating policies to make real change. I think this goes with what my, my former FDA colleague uh, Jay said earlier, which is um, it's not a one and done. And we've said this a lot of times. I think we had a fantastic start uh, when um, as an FDA employee, I went to ONC and worked collaboratively and strategically with ONC and CMS to ensure coordination of UDI activities. Um, that kicked things off, of course, but as everybody's mentioning, more policies are needed. Um, and the federal government really needs to um, be a leader on this. It not only needs to be a leader locally in the US, but globally, uh, there's IMDRF work that was initiated back in 2006. Um, application guides, those kinds of harmonization activities would, would benefit from federal leadership and regulatory leadership. Um, I also wanna echo the UDI competency, I call it. Um, and from my point of view as a solution provider now, there I have seen um, significant lack of basic knowledge among those who play major roles in IT system development, um, those who are working uh, with hospitals to integrate this data. Um, and it, I echo the same, uh, you know, that's been mentioned earlier. Lack of understanding, like what is UDI? Who has authority over it? Why should they use good ID and not create their own data? All kinds of issues like that. Um, the, the idea that UDI um, be required, um, I, I hesitate about that somewhat in that um, when you put a requirement on something without an understanding or without incentives or policies that, that build a strategy, um, we get a lot of checking in the box, which I think is where we are in some ways with UDI and manufacturers. So I would be cautious of just calling for requirements. And I'll end with my, my biggest concern um, and one that uh, I know that the RMLEC and I have advocated for, which is the lack of UDI um, in recalls. And ideally it would have been required in 2015 at the same time UDI was included in EHR certification requirements um, to capture that UDI in the patient record for implants and capture the UDI DI for recalls so that patients could be notified of those implanted um, devices that were in their body. It hasn't been done, it's still not done. Um, it will be a very happy day when that uh, we start seeing consistent uh, use of UDI in recalls. So those Thanks, are my Terry. kind of top four. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Um, Olga, I know you have uh, seen uh, quite a few different uh, uh, experiences. Can you share some of the barriers you've seen? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. So in the, EU, in the EU, of course, we're at the start of our UDI journey and, and Jay and Dennis did an excellent job earlier of calling out some of the challenges implementing UDI from a regulatory and a manufacturer perspective. 
So I'm going to focus more on general challenges I've personally encountered within the EU ecosystem as a whole. And I suppose, to be honest, echoing some of the sent uh, sentiments of my fellow panelists. So, you know, it's vitally important that the various economic operators and actors involved in the healthcare ecosystem really understand the intent of the UDI system requirements and how it's meant to work in order to aid in the traceability of medical devices within the supply chain. And that includes having a holistic understanding of what exactly the obligations of each economic operator are and which ones apply to you. So I have a couple of very um, basic examples, but, but I think they kind of show the level of understanding where we're at at the moment. So my local RA counterparts um, have received and continue to receive requests from multiple hospitals in various EU member states asking us, the manufacturer, to provide them with the UDI of the class three implantable devices that they procure from us. And there's a lack of understanding that the UDI retention requirement is for the healthcare um, institute to record the whole UDI, including both the static UDI GI information and the dynamic UDI PI information is on the healthcare institutions to capture the full UDI information on the label of the individual unit of the device for which they've been supplied in order to keep a record of that UDI, preferably by electronic means. Then on the other hand, um, I've also seen uh, examples of questions from notified bodies responsible for the certification of devices on the quality management system to the MDR asking, you know, how are you providing the UDI GI to your customers? Um, and it wasn't a labeling question. So we encountered in one instance an expectation that we would provide lists of UDI GIs to healthcare institutions of devices with which we've provided to them. Again, you know, really missing the intent of the legislation that each actor within the supply chain records the UDI of the individual unit of each device at which they've been supplied. So for me, this is indicative of a fundamental lack of understanding of how the UDI system as a whole in the EU is supposed to function. And it certainly represents a barrier to success for UDI in the EU at the moment. Thanks so much. Um, I we have one more question and then uh, we'd like to go over some resources to share with everyone. Uh, but I would um, ask our panelists to uh, think about this question and maybe give us just a one minute response so that we have time for questions at the end. Understanding UDI and its global counterparts, including Udimed, require getting involved. Um, I'm sorry, uh, from your perspective, what can be done to promote UDI's successful implementation across the ecosystem? and address some of the barriers that we've discussed. Um, Terry? Sure, uh, I'll go really fast, as fast <laughs> as I can. <laughs> um, so I am a big believer, if you haven't caught it already, in public-private partnerships and, and our learning UDI community has over 600 members. So I thought it would be appropriate if I would just share and connect dots for this audience with some, some work that ARM has done which I believe answers your question. So they wrote public comments back to FDA. Um, and here are some things that I think will lead to success. If we include both the UDI-DI and UDI-PI in all communications from FDA regarding device safety, adverse event reporting, recalls and correction notices, um, use the UDI as the link between all FDA databases, consider using UDI back to the recalls, getting it into recalls says it will provide value not only for um, supply chain, but for clinical care. Um, Jabe said this one, but I'll echo it again. UDI should be included on all products. And the more this like inclusion on all products, linking together of products, um, the more value it provides actually, and the more people understand that value. So those are my uh, top ones. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute, one more. Is <laughs> sure. So the last one is that we need funding. We need funding of pilots, um, not just having these collaborative communities, but they always struggle with the same thing, which they are not federally funded um, to achieve a goal. And there's a lot of opportunities for innovation. Um, CMS has an innovation uh, group. There's no reason in my mind why UDI couldn't be part of that kind of activity. Thank you, Terry. Natalia? Um, I, I'm going to focus um, just back on how we can get 
um, UDI captured at the uh, point of care in clinical care. And I know Terry expressed some reservations about requirement, but um, unfortunately I feel that without some teeth in something, um, broadly hospital systems are not gonna do this. They have too much on their plate. So whether we wanna call it a requirement or an incentive or penalty, I mean, an analogy is what happened with electronic health records that started as an incentive then transition to a penalty. Um, and we've advanced electronic health records. So I think we just really need to think through how we can advance this critical step of um, UDI um, uh, capture and, and documentation. And I, I think there's really many areas when it comes to support of, of some sort of policy change. Uh, we need federal leadership uh, certainly, I talked about leadership, so did Terry. Um, we're working to really target research projects to think how could they inform policy and practice. Um, certainly, advocacy. Um, and, and really, I think another multi-stakeholder forum just focused on this issue. How do we implement and move forward with adoption in health systems? Um, so I have other things to say, but I will call it at that in the... Uh, <laughs> Because of time. <laughs> Thank you. Olga? I'll, I'll try to be really quick. <laughs> so for me, education and dialogue are key to promoting both the harmonized and successful implementation of EDI across the ecosystem. So that includes, of course, you know, the regulators in the EU, our notified bodies. And for me, one of the biggest gaps at the moment, perhaps, is with the healthcare institutions. Uh, looking back to Dr. Chang's outstanding presentation and the insights provided by my esteemed colleagues on this panel, I think once all stakeholders are educated, talking to each other and working together towards a common goal, we can then really start to unleash the amazing potential of medical unique device identification. Thank you so very much. And um, Natalia, I know that you are going to share just a few um, thoughts on ways to get involved, but I know we want to yeah. open this up to questions. So um, yeah. I just wanted to um, maybe jump really quick to the resources and have you yeah. comment on this. Yeah, I just I, I just encourage everybody who's attended to these are wonderful resources for you. I want to call out the NEST CC UDI Resource Center that just went live last week. That is a fairly comprehensive for different audiences. Uh, resource that uh, what is UDI, what's the good ID benefits, and very importantly, has uh, a whole list of the publications um, to date and links to those um, that you can access. And these are really important to share with colleagues, share with leadership um, to really push things forward. So I'll call it at that, Patty. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and for the um, everyone attending, I, I believe that this uh, this will be shared. This this presentation will be shared with you. Obviously, want to thank all our speakers during this uh, seminar. Uh, it was really great information, and also, as you see on our screen now, there's a lot of resources uh, that you can go to to learn a little bit more. And that we here at AIM are always uh, willing to help out as well. So we do hope to hear from you and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to educate on uh, UDI. Uh, so appreciate everyone again. Thank you.